Around 45 BCE, silk was introduced to Rome. Depending on what route you take, this luxurious fabric traveled over 6,400 kilometers on its way from China and likely would have changed many hands. It wasn't long before spices, produce, and other cloth was moving east to west, south to north, and everywhere in between all over Asia, the Mediterranean, and North Africa, which some stories say took anywhere from several months to almost 10 years. And the routes got more elaborate or simple depending on who controlled them and what taxes and fees traders were trying to avoid. This collection of routes, which thrived for almost 1,600 years, became known as the Silk Road. But today, they are more often called the Silk Roads to acknowledge just how many routes, people, and places were a part of this network. And even today, over 2,000 years since silk first appeared in Rome, exploring the Silk Roads can tell us a lot about how worldviews and other ideas spread along those trade routes and eventually influenced the beliefs of billions of people through time and space. I'm Alize Carrer, and this is Crash Course Geography. In cultural geography, we're specifically interested in how and why culture changes. 1,600 years of trading along the Silk Roads offers lots of examples of how diffusion, or the spread of ideas across space, happened as traders mingled and left artifacts like maps and statues behind. Imagine those late nights as travelers from all over the world were staying at an inn, a monastery, or other lodging. Maybe after an evening meal, they'd share folklore from their homelands. These are stories that were passed on, often by spoken word, that educate a community about their history. Or maybe they'd skip the stories and go straight to how they see current conditions in the world. Either way, and in other ways too, they'd share a little bit about their worldview, which is a set of beliefs, morals, and attitudes about the world and a person's role in it. Our worldview is transmitted to us by a community, but then shaped and changed by our life experience. It helps us answer questions that come from our natural human curiosity, like what is the meaning of life? How did the universe form? What is my purpose? What is truth? Is there banana in this soup? The way we approach these questions and the way we develop and share knowledge is a fundamental cultural trait, one of those building blocks that make up our unique cultural identity, like language. Specifically, a religion is a belief system and set of practices that help a community define what is acceptable. Religions can be driven by theology, or belief in a divine power, but there are also belief systems guided by morals and principles without the presence of something beyond humans. Now, I just want to take a moment to say talking about culture is really hard. If you're taking an AP test or an intro to geography class, you might see some religions put into categories that don't perfectly match how they exist and are practiced in the world today. And that makes being a human geographer really hard, but also really exciting. People are complicated, and there's so much nuance to what we're studying. So we'll do our best to explain the definitions we're using, the time period we're talking about, and why or how certain religions fall into different categories. But just remember, the lines are pretty blurry. Like in Malaysia, we saw how belief systems can literally imprint on a space as people travel, just like we imagined with those late night travelers, which is eventually how we end up with places of worship built with both Chinese and European elements, or people in Malaysia and Indonesia practicing the same denomination of Islam as people in Saudi Arabia. And to us geographers, the movement of people's beliefs and how they build their identity through those beliefs can tell us a lot about the movement of power, empire, and people around the planet. In fact, relics from the time of the Silk Roads show belief systems mingling and moving, if you know where to look. Around 150 CE, Claudius Ptolemy, a Greek scholar living in Alexandria, wrote a book that contained what Europeans would eventually use to create what they thought was the map of the world. His descriptions of how to draw a two-dimensional map of our three-dimensional world have been so celebrated that Western geographers sometimes call him the father of geography. Now we know that his map projections were really amazing for the time, but there were a lot of meaningful geographic advances before his book and between when Ptolemy published his calculations and when Byzantines rediscovered them 1,145 years later. Ptolemy's calculations are exciting because they use latitude and longitude lines, which we might take for granted now, but are a really amazing mathematical innovation. He's also credited for working out the rough boundaries of land, even land he hadn't seen before. And even though we don't have any versions he drew himself, the math behind the map tells us about Ptolemy's worldview. Map makers before Ptolemy had sized different countries based on how important they were. So even though many of his calculations were later proven incorrect, Ptolemy introducing math changed cartography forever. And to the careful geographic eye, this map also reveals a lot about the worldview of the cartographer who later drew the map. Like the way Ethiopia is sort of all of Sub-Saharan Africa or how it looks like people are blowing the wind around the world, which gives a slight nod to cherubs and Greek mythology. 
Along the Silk Roads, we'd also find maps that reveal other belief systems and multiple religious hearths, or places of origin, from which different religions diffused out. Today, the former lands of the Silk Roads are still known for a large number of people practicing an ethnic religion, which is one of the two broad categories of faiths and includes religions that are typically tied closely to a place or group of people from a particular culture. Like within ethnic religions, there are often animist traditions, or ethnic religions that worship based on the local environment. Animist traditions often understand that non-humans in nature have spiritual power to help, harm, and teach humans. Within geography, belief systems we'd find on the Silk Roads like Shintoism, Taoism, and Confucianism are often considered ethnic religions because of how the cultural mechanisms to teach the belief system are woven into their place of origin. Like Shinto shrines are very important areas for worship and are rarely found outside Japan. That doesn't mean those practices don't exist outside of those places and peoples, or that other places won't be added as the belief system changes over time. It just means they're usually closely associated with one group of people or one place. Now, when a religion or belief system spreads and becomes accessible to a wide part of the population outside of its hearth, a religion is said to be universal. In general, universal religions are seen as ones that spread easily, are easy for people in any location to convert to, and don't need a person to come from a particular ethnic group to fully participate in that faith. Ethnic or universal are examples of those messy categories we try and use to understand religion. But it's complicated. Like if some people from what is now India moved along the Silk Road starting in the fourth century, they would have brought their belief systems with them. What originally developed in the Hindu religious hearth was probably something called Brahmanism. Then as people practiced this belief system, it would have changed, eventually becoming more recognizable as Hinduism, which has inspired what are considered distinctively Indian cultural traits. But those traits can also diffuse, often through relocation diffusion, which is one of the broad categories of diffusion and is when people move and take their beliefs. That ease of movement occurs in part because this faith practice is also able to incorporate a wide range of beliefs. So it's common in geography texts to see Hinduism put into the ethnic religion category because it's most accessible in India. But Hinduism today has elements of both ethnic and universal faiths and is a major world religion. Faith leaders of all major religions would have also had places called caravanserais for travelers to rest along the Silk Roads. For example, there were several Buddhist monasteries on the road connecting Bactria to Taxila. While there was no fee for lodging, travelers often would make a donation as a sign of generosity. In return, the monks would impart spiritual guidance. So over time, some traders might have made a regular habit of stopping to learn from particular monks, and through that habit, followers of Buddhism increased. This is an example of a type of contagion diffusion, or the spread of ideas from contact, which is a type of expansion diffusion, the other broad category of diffusion. So maybe it's not a coincidence that a majority of the faiths we'd describe as universal can be traced to origins along the Silk Roads, and that within each of these broad religion groups, there are hundreds of denominations and local practices. Today we can look back and see how other ideas diffused along the Silk Roads too. Throughout the Middle East and North Africa, the cultural importance placed on education, first from the Greeks, then Romans, then Muslims, led to one of the oldest existing and currently operating universities being established in Fez, in what is now Morocco in the 9th century CE. Fez became a center of education, which, along with the many large cities along the Silk Roads, often had hierarchical diffusion, another type of expansion diffusion that we see when a prominent population practices a cultural trait. Slowly, the idea spreads to smaller towns and the surrounding area. As a product of those learning systems, by 1154 CE, there was a new map of the Silk Roads made by Muhammad al-Adrisi, an Arab Muslim geographer, traveler, and scholar that came from the Almoravid Empire in what is now called Morocco. This map came from first-hand reports of travelers and geographers that worked for him, as well as his own research. Artifacts like al adrisis map leave behind clues about how people interacted with and saw the world, just like Ptolemy's. This map was notable because like many maps by Muslim and Chinese cartographers, south was oriented at the top of the map, not north. While there's no definitive explanation for why maps were oriented that way, by orienting the map with south at the top of the page, the Holy Land of Mecca is often central to the map. Maps often reveal what was important to the cartographers making them. And in fact, the Islamic Holy Land would have been important to many people, since it's also holy to the other Abrahamic faiths, Christianity and Judaism. In 2020, the three major Abrahamic faiths are practiced by over half of the world's population. That huge spread has several reasons, but one would be various types of expansion diffusion, which is when a cultural trait develops in a center and then moves outward. Though the Middle East and North Africa wasn't the only site of significant diffusion. By 1402 CE, what we now call Korea and China became places of great cultural mixing, especially along the trade routes between present-day India, Tibet, China, and Korea. At that time, there was a Korean map called the Gangnido that would have been used that's thought to have been completed with the aid of Muslim and Chinese maps. And like the maps before it, 
The Gangnido is significant because it shows a worldview that's centered on the homeland of the cartographers, and is one of the earliest maps to get the shape of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula mostly correct. Today's religious map shows a world full of unique interpretations of morality and beliefs. And this map is deceiving. Remember, with a thematic map like this, the nuance of the data is obscured. Like, there are lots of cases of cultural acculturation along the Silk Roads, where people would pick and choose different elements to combine. Ultimately, we end up with something related, but different. In some of these cases, we end up with faiths that combine the core beliefs from two or more religions, which are called syncretic religions. And thematic maps can't show this complexity, the merging and overlap of religions regionally, and that there are multiple religions in each of these places. As we know, maps are often created from the worldview of the cartographer and can prioritize certain stories, like where the center of the world is, or can minimize others, like the location or prominence of ethnic faiths. But by comparing maps throughout history, we can see that the Silk Roads played a major role in facilitating the diffusion of knowledge, both academic and religious, along with the movement of goods like spices and silk. Today, hundreds of years later, we still feel the impact of the way knowledge has developed, like in the spices we use when we cook, the cloth we see as beautiful, and the traditions and rituals we practice. All of these changed along the Silk Roads and will continue to change as our cultures share knowledge and make it their own. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course Geography, which is filmed at the Team Sandoval Pier Studio and was made with the help of all these nice people. If you want to help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever, you can join our community on Patreon.